السلام عليكم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد All praise, thanks and glory belong to Allah, the one true God, the Lord of everything in existence We ask him to bless his messenger Muhammad, to elevate his mention and rank and to shower him with protection and grace along with his family and his righteous followers as he did with Ibrahim, his family and righteous followers in the past. Welcome to another episode of The Messenger's Hajj, where we're covering the different interactions that the Messenger of God had, the different states that he was in, the different conditions that he experienced. And we had completed the chapter regarding his connection with his Lord and how he showed his dutifulness and how he showed his devotion and how he showed his um, humility and humbleness before his Lord. We moved on to the next section, which has to do with community work. How did the Messenger of God interact with his community during the pilgrimage? And we were speaking about the role of him being a teacher. So what was it that he was teaching during this time? Because the pilgrimage is something very specific. So we're going to see that he was teaching people multiple things based on the following examples that are highlighted. The very primary focus of his teaching, of his instruction during the pilgrimage was regarding the rights of the pilgrimage, ahkamul manasik. And what he showcased sallallahu alayhi wasallama is the theoretical aspect of the instruction as uh, as well as the practical aspect because the ritual is composed of actions it's not just statements so um, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again many people think that he only gave one sermon but the reality is he spoke on multiple occasions and gave multiple addresses the first one was the day before at tarwiyah so the seventh day of the hijjah he gave a sermon to the people and he explained to them what the ritual is made out of. And this is what we typically do again as group leaders whenever we go for Hajj. We will have a session of giving instruction about how to perform Umrah and how to perform Hajj. A type of workshop of sorts. And then whenever he would do a specific rite, he would also explain and relay to the people what are the different rules and regulations related to it. So we're going to break this down. How did he do so? He uh, explained the importance of the foundations of Islam, what is coined as the pillars of Islam, Arkan al-Islam, which are the foundational actions of Islam, the, the, uh, the base and the root by which the tree of Islam grows. In one of the sermons and addresses that he gave in the season of Hajj, the pilgrimage, he says, Ittaqu Rabbakum, which is give reverential fear to your Lord. Fear your Lord, be conscious of him. What does that entail? Put a shield between yourselves and his punishment by doing his commands and stay away from his, staying away from his prohibitions. وَصَلُّوا خَمْسَكُمْ and perform the five daily salawat. Perform the five daily ritual acts of devotion. وَصُومُوا شَهْرَكُمْ And fast your month, i.e. the month of Ramadan. وَأَدُّوا زَكَاةَ أَمْوَالِكُمْ And give and offer the share of your wealth, your savings, which is your alms, from your wealth and your money. وَأَطِيعُوا ذَا أَمْرِكُمْ And obey the one that is in command of you. Obey your commanders. Obey your leaders. تَدْخُلُوا جَنَّةَ رَبِّكُمْ If you do all of the above, you will enter into the garden of your Lord. You will enter into paradise. So here we're seeing, although he's in the pilgrimage, he's giving this general address regarding the foundational actions of Islam. Five daily salah, fasting the month of Ramadan, giving zakah, and then obeying those that are in leadership over us. Another thing that he did, sallallahu alayhi wa is to prohibit associating partners with, 
with God in his exclusive rights, which is called a shirk. And also he announced the prohibition to some of the gravest offenses and crimes, some of the most offensive forbidden aspects, which uh, all of the previous messengers came with. So this is something that the shara'i' of the past were all in agreement with, such as spilling blood, so murder, killing others, taking others' wealth or property, and also dishonoring others, slandering them, and speaking ill regarding their integrity. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَإِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَعْرَاضَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ حَرَامٌ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَهْرِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا We've mentioned the statement before, but again, it's very important to remind ourselves of this because this is what explains the social um, interaction that we should have as a community. What are community relations supposed to be like among the believers? This is the principle. These are the boundaries that should not be trespassed, that should not be crossed. He says your blood, your life, your wealth, your property, your honor, dignity, all of that is forbidden for you to attack, for you to abuse, for you to take unjustly between each other, just like the sanctity of this particular day and of this particular month and of this particular town, which are all sacred. Al-Yawm Al-Haram and Al-Shahr Al-Haram and Al-Balad Al-Haram. You have sacred land, sacred month and sacred day. So the messenger is saying, your wealth, your honor and your blood among each other is sacred, it is sanctified, it is not supposed to be abused, and it is not supposed to be attacked. He also says, إِنَّمَا هُنَّ أَرْبَعٌ لَا تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا تَسْرِقُوا وَلَا تَزْنُوا He says, surely there are four. What are we talking about? We're talking about those major prohibited actions. So the biggest of crimes. When we talk about crime in Islam, these are the biggest crimes, the biggest physical manifestations of crime. He says, they are four. Do not associate partners with God in His exclusive rights. Do not kill a life that God has sanctified except with due cause, meaning let's say it's out of due process and someone is to be killed out of compensation for killing someone else. That would be a lawful cause of killing them. That would not be prohibited. And this is how you reconcile between the, the reports and the statements and the teachings and the commandments. وَلَا تَسْرُقُوا Do not steal. So this is the prohibition of theft. وَلَا تَزْنُوا Do not fornicate. Do not commit adultery. Do not have sexual relations outside of a proper contract. Do not have sexual relations outside of a proper contract. And if you notice, again, these are some of the worst major sins. These are all min al mubiqat. They're considered the deadly sins, the sins that will destroy an individual and also destroy their faith. So this is a second aspect of his instruction, of his teaching to his community, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Likewise. He explained some of the general regulations within Islam, within the Sharia, the sacred law of God, such as how to bathe a person who's in a state of ihram if they die. So someone who's in a state of restriction, how to bathe them, give them the bath, and how to shroud them if they were to die. As it's reported in the narration of Ibn Abbas, Allah be pleased with him and his father, says, بَيْنَمَا رَجُلٌ وَاقِفٌ بِعَرَفَةٌ إِذْ وَقَعَ عَنْ رَاحِلَتِهِ فَوَقَصَتْهُ There was a man who was standing as in stationary in Arafah, on the day of Arafah, and he fell. He fell off of his camel. And then the camel stepped over him. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم, so the camel stepped on him and killed him basically. So the injury was fatal. 
The Messenger says, اغسلوه بماء وسدر Wash him, bathe him with water and with a specific type of herb which is used in place of soap. وَكَفِّنُوهُ فِي ثَوْبَيْنِ And shroud him in two cloths. وَلَا تُحَنِّطُوهُ And do not put perfume on him. وَلَا تُخَمِّرُوا رَأْسَهُ And do not cover his head. فَإِنَّهُ يُبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مُلَبِّيًا He will come on the Day of Judgment. He will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment. Repeating the talbiyah, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, because that was how he died. He died in a state of talbiyah, responding to Allah's call in the pilgrimage, and he will be resurrected in that state. Now, the scholars take from this, that general principle that an individual will be resurrected doing the action that he died doing. And that's why we should all be keen on making sure that we fill our times with doing good things, because we don't know when our time is going to be up. But if you're dead or you die doing, a, doing good things, doing a righteous deed, then you will be resurrected in that state. And that's a, that's a blessing. That's a huge blessing. Um, he says, today, in our time, in our generation, unfortunately, so look at the contrast between the condition of the life of the messenger, the condition of his interaction with his community, especially during Hajj, but throughout his life. And we said the primary role of the Messenger is to teach, to give instruction, to give direction, to give guidance, to educate. So an educator. At-ta'lim. إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ muallima. I was only sent as a teacher, as one who gives instructions and guidance. He says, today we notice that ignorance Ignorance here is not necessarily ignorance in science and technology. He says ignorance, illiteracy regarding religious fundamentals and regarding religious teachings and regarding the principles and the commandments of Allah. He says that unfortunately is something that is manifest in our community. He says the majority of the people fall short in their literacy. He says some of us are so ignorant, we're ignorant of things that should not be, uh, that we should not be ignorant of. And many of us forget many aspects of our religion that should not be forgotten. So he says, for many people, much of Islamic principles and teachings are completely missing. They're not even around. They are not even aware of them or the fact that they exist. The principles and the foundations of Islam are unknown for many people. And he says, there is many people who simply claim Islam, they identify as Muslim, but it's only simply that identity. It's an ethnic identity. It's an inherited identity because we come from a historical Muslim family or culture. It's a history connection. It's an emotional connection, but that's basically it. It doesn't go beyond that. And that's very, very sad. He says, it's the association and the identity of Islam for many people is a historic, emotional, or inherited one more than it is a connection and identi identity that's based on understanding and comprehension and conviction. It's not based on application and practice. It is something that has allowed for the people of misguidance, for the people of deviance, for the people of evil intent to spread their falsehood and to spread their propaganda among the masses. Now, if the masses were immune, if they had immunity, if they had strong religious conviction, they will see straight through the propaganda. But when you have a vacuum, when you are weak, when you don't have immunity, you are susceptible to these ideological attacks, to these problematic ideas, to these superstitious beliefs, to these mythological fairy tale types of religious practices, which have nothing to do with Islam whatsoever. And how does this propaganda get spread? How do these marketing schemes take place? People who have this evil intent, they spread it by attraction. They make it very attracting. They make it very appealing. 
And then when someone is ignorant, when someone is naive, they think darkness is light. They don't know any better. Like a child who's innocent and pure and naive, they think that someone smiling at them is someone who's going to be kind with them. But that individual may be a monster. It may be a pedophile, God forbid. Money individuals, unfortunately, they think that the stuff that is wrong is the truth. What is not acceptable in Islam, they believe that it is acceptable. And all of that is due to Muslims being ignorant of much of their faith tradition and not having the proper literacy, not having the proper confidence in why am I doing this? Where does it come from? And am I convinced about it? And is this something that I am taking on, not just during the Hajj season, but throughout my life? Many people among the Muslims have high levels of emotional attachment to Islam. But when you don't know any better, you think that some of this ignorance that spread is part of Islam and due to your emotional attachment, you cling onto it. And that actually increases the spread and increases the publication of this type of falsehood. And then truth, proper teachings of Islam, knowledge-based Islam, Islam that is taught by the messenger and taught by his Sahaba and taught by the Imams and the scholars throughout the ages, becomes something that is strange, becomes something that's weird, becomes something that is not very customary because the customs of ignorance, of deviance, of invented practices in the religion are so widespread. If you try to practice proper Islam, people say, no, that's not what Islam is. Because they have clung onto these things that unfortunately have become so widespread. He says that we see millions of people coming to the pilgrimage, coming to this great season, this conference, this assembly of human masses. They come to the holy precincts, they come to the sacred lands one year after the other. He says, this is a great opportunity for the people of knowledge. It's an opportune time for the people of knowledge. And when we say again, people of knowledge, it refers to the scholars of Islam, people who have the literacy of Islam. They've mastered the different sciences of Islam. It is an opportune time for them to educate these masses, to educate them in the principles of Islam in the foundational beliefs of Islam, and also in the practices of Islam, in the traditions of Islam, and also encouraging people to be proud of being Muslim and to ignite in them zeal for Islam, zeal to act upon it, to practice it, to be confident about all of that, to also preach it and to teach it and to share it with others and to protect it and to defend it against attacks and doubts and misconceptions and allegations. So here he says that it becomes an obligation for every student of knowledge, for everyone who is attached to learning the sciences of Islam, the sciences of the Sharia. It says, he says it becomes an obligation for them to go and perform the pilgrimage and um, if, if they are able to perform the pilgrimage, meaning they're physically able to perform the pilgrimage, it becomes an obligation on them to share what they know and to teach and to relay the message and to be available to educate and to instruct and to guide people to the best of their ability in order for us to remove this cloud of ignorance that is shading many communities and many demographics among the Muslims and so we can remove this darkness and replace it with light to spread this blessed knowledge and to raise it up high so our community can go back to practicing with confidence, practicing with dignity, practicing the religion, being committed to it with integrity, not simply blindly following traditions and customs that make no sense. Many people unfortunately just go through the motions. And it is so sad in Hajj when people are just going through the motions. Now, you may have to go through the motions during crowds, but that's the job of the teachers and the guides that before we get into crowds, we give people a heads up and we educate people and we answer their questions and we allow them to be confident in what they're about to do. 
Not that we're taking them by the hand every step of the way because it is so difficult. You can only take two people by the hand. You only have two sets of hands. So you take one person by the right hand and one person by the left hand. There is thousands of people. Typically, every group leader is assigned to a whole bus. That's 50 human beings. It's extremely challenging to speak to all of these people when things get rough, in the heat of the moment, during the crowds. So we should all learn about the pilgrimage, about the rituals, about the regulations, but not just that. I want us to make this an opportunity to speak about taking learning Islam seriously. We are offering these online opportunities so people can learn more. And we have many other offerings in this particular institution and other institutions do the same thing. So it is a, a, very important, uh, a very important part of our lives to learn Islam, to dedicate time that we invest to learning Islam. And this is not to say that it is sufficient what we have learned as children. It's like many people say, I learned this in Sunday school. You're an adult now. It's a shame to say I learned something in Sunday school. What did you learn in adult school? You cannot base your religious practice on what you learned as a child because knowledge is age appropriate. What we teach little children is not the same that we teach adults. Little children will teach them certain things that will allow them to practice, but we need to constantly renew our knowledge. We need to constantly refine our knowledge. We need to constantly fix any gaps and fill any gaps that we may have. And that only comes with investing time. If you are in any career in any career path, there is constant improvement. There is always development, personal development. People go on trainings constantly. Any company that respects itself gives its employees trainings. Well, what kind of training have we done in Islam as adults? I want us to reflect over that. Or is our practice rusty? Even the highest, the most elite group in society, doctors, they are constantly required to do readings on medical journals and to study the latest advancements in the science of their own expertise and the latest things in medicine and the latest medical gadgets and machinery and the latest technology. How about us as Muslims? Is Islam less dear and important to us than people's careers are to them? Your career is not going to grant you salvation, but Islam will grant you salvation. So an invitation for all of us to pay attention to the aspect of learning in Islam, being educated and constantly improving our understanding of scripture, of the messenger's tradition, of the rules and regulations of Islam, of the spiritual practices of Islam, their spiritual refinement of Islam, the character building of Islam, all of that is our personal development. And you may ask, so how do I sign up in those trainings? Sign up in the courses that we have. There is many courses that we have in part-time seminary, we have courses in full-time seminary, and we have these public courses for the community. But make sure you are learning. And if you're not an online learner, no problem, find a physical person to learn with. Sit in the company of people of knowledge and learn from them and spend time with them. Learn from their good mannerisms and learn from their good character. Learn the theoretical aspects of knowledge and learn the practical aspects of knowledge. But make sure you're constantly involved in learning. We should always be involved in learning. التعليم والتعلم Educating others and being educated. Giving instruction and following instruction. Sharing guidance and receiving guidance. This is the way of the believer. The messenger says that طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم. Seeking knowledge and he was speaking very specifically about knowledge about Allah and how to worship Allah. That type of knowledge is an obligation on every single Muslim. It's not an obligation for you to become an expert in every field of knowledge in the world. But in the in the aspects of Islam that are going to help you attain salvation, knowing the basics of your belief, knowing the basics of the practices of Islam, and knowing the basics of spiritual refinement. That is something that is an obligation on every single Muslim. It's not optional. It's not voluntary. It's an obligation. May Allah enable us 
to learn and to practice and to disseminate, disseminate and to teach others and to spread this knowledge. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka Hamidun Majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka Hamidun Majid. We ask you Allah to bless the Messenger Muhammad, to honor him, to compliment him, to shower him with protection and grace. And to bless his family and his righteous followers as he did with Ibrahim, his family and righteous followers in the past. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una, wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma. We ask oh Allah to teach us what benefits us and to allow us to attain benefit from what you have taught us and to increase us in knowledge that is beneficial for us. To increase us in action as well and application. Allahumma inna ka'afu and tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you love to pardon and you're the most forgiving, so please forgive us and pardon us. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadatik. We ask you Allah to help us and to assist us to mention you and to remember you at all times, to be grateful to you for all your blessings through our words and through our actions and to worship you in the best of ways according to the model and the example of your beloved messenger Muhammad. And until next time, I fear you well. Keep learning and keep educating yourself about Islam. Islam is about learning. Al-ilmu qabla al-qawli wal-amal. That is the principle in Islam. Knowledge precedes statements and actions. Before I do, before I say, I must learn. And in order for me to learn, I must ask. And in order for me to ask, I must know who to ask. And the next episode, we're going to talk briefly about that. So until next time, Assalamu Alaikum. I leave you in the trust of Allah. I leave you in His protection. May you all be showered with His grace and His blessings.